Welcome back, everyone. Those of you who are fortunate enough to see Casey Shelfler's talk before lunch titled, Does Making the Colonel Harder Make Making the Colonel Harder? I'm sure you will also agree that this will make an excellent follow-up to that talk, as this talk is titled, Making C Less Dangerous in the Linux Kernel. Can I get your order? Please welcome <laughs> Keys Cook. Um, hi, thanks for coming after lunch. Um, uh, this is one title, and I have another title screen because there wasn't room for URL on the prior slide. So um, this is making C less dangerous in the Linux kernel. Um, my name is spelled that way, which is the Dutch spelling, but it's just pronounced case. Um, I respond to whatever though. Um, <laughs> but if you want to follow along, I have some links, uh, some of the bullet lists and things have links and other things you might want to click through. Um, uh, I'll have this up and you can get it, but if you want to follow along right now, it's uh, at that URL. Um, so, um, as, as mentioned, um, this presentation is about the Linux kernel and uh, the use of C there because uh, while most people will agree that C is a crazy and dangerous language, it is somewhat difficult to change a multi-million line code base away from C. So we have what we have. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit first about the kernel self-protection project um, and that C is just a fancy assembler. Um, and then uh, a bunch of things we've looked at as far as uh, avoiding the pitfalls uh, of using C itself. Um, so uh, in 2015, watching the, the general rising tide of interest uh, in security, especially in the kernel, um, I kicked off the kernel self-protection project as a way to try to herd all the cats together to try and work on uh, defenses in the kernel. Um, specifically, I wanted the project to focus on protecting the kernel from user space rather than uh, protecting user space from itself and all the things that the kernel can do to support the defenses in user space because there are a lot of those already and I felt like uh, catching the kernel up uh, in defenses was, was a needed area. Um, and I'm, this, the numbers are getting harder and harder to count because there are so many things going on but roughly speaking participation in the, in the projects has been pretty decent. Um, I've had like about 12 organizations and 10 individuals working on like I don't know, 20 technologies, it's pretty scattered. Um, but I like to sort of think of the project as you know, slow and steady. Um, in, the, in the kernel hardening buff uh, just before this, I, I talked a little bit about, you know, even if we see something that's gonna take, oh man, it's gonna take forever for us to do that. It'll take uh, three years for this or that. It's like, okay, that's fine. I just wanna start the clock. Because if we never actually start the timer, we'll never get there. So we're going to break some of the catch-22s in, in implementing these things by just starting now. And eventually we'll finish and then we'll have it. Um, because we can't just magically wave a wand. Um, so, as many of you are probably aware, C is, from a certain perspective, a fancy assembler. Um, you're very close to machine code. Um, and this is a reasonable choice for the kernel because it wants to be fast and small and as close to the, to the, to the machine code as possible. And you want to do really architecture specific things. Uh, there is no C API for setting up page tables and switching CPU modes and doing all these things that are implicitly machine code. Um, and in fact, Sometimes we are using literal machine code uh, in, in the kernel to do these things uh, and wrapping C around it, but there is no uh, specific C API. Um, now, with the fancy assembler comes undefined behavior. Um, so the, the C language has a huge history and a lot of operational baggage and even weak standard library, uh, libraries and things like that. Um, there's questions over, well, what about the contents of uninitialized variables? Well, it's undefined, but there's still behavior with that. Whatever was in memory before is what's in your uninitialized variable. So it is quite initialized. Uh, you just don't know necessarily with what. Um, someone very interested in taking advantage of that may spend the time to figure out what it's been initialized with and figure out a way to control it. Um, also going from C to assembly, uh, you have void pointers but you can call functions through a void pointer. 
Uh, so all the type information about what arguments are going in and out of that function, what the return value is, all of that semantic information is lost when you go down to machine code. Um, and you get weird standard library things. I'll come back to this one. But memcopy has no concept of the destination buffer size. Um, you say how much you want to copy. That's nice. But how do you know what's at your target? Um, there's nothing implicit in the API to, to support that. Um, and a, a wonderful, wonderful blog, which this shirt is from, um, was with undefined behavior, anything is possible, uh, which is not great if you, would, uh, if you want to control the behavior of your system uh, against people who would like to subvert it. Um, one of the first things I want to talk about was uh, variable length arrays uh, and alloc A, which is effectively the same thing. It's dynamic allocation of a stack variable space on the stack. Um, so if you have an unbounded VLA or you don't check the lengths of your, of your stack allocations like this, you end up, you may exhaust the stack and start writing over whatever followed the stack. Um, that's the first diagram is, sure, I have a giant buffer, but my stack is a limited size in the kernel, so I'll just keep writing across it and into whatever's next. Um, so, okay, fine, we can, we can stop that kind of linear overflow by adding a guard page between, so you go writing along and then you fault and you're good. Well, what if it's an array and you just jump over the guard page to do your writing? Well, that's not great either. Um, and, of course, stack protectors, like, like stack cookies, don't help in this situation because you're, as the attacker, you're actually controlling the size of the stack and the cookie is going to be after that, so you're no protection there either. Um, the nice thing is compilers let you actually find these because they're annoying for a compiler to deal with too and they would like to have you not do it. Uh, so if you compile with dash uh, warn VLA, you'll at least find them. Um, and if for some reason you can't just get rid of these and you're in user space, not the kernel, um, you can do, use GCC's stack probing feature. Um, this was from the stack clash attack uh, where the idea is you never notice that the guard page ran into something because you just do this giant growth of the stack. Um, so the stack clash protection actually will probe the stack in user space every page size. So it'll try to read out the memory and that'll slowly push the guard page into colliding and exploding instead of magically jumping past everything. Um, so if you're in user space, not the kernel, please use that flag if you can't just get rid of VLAs completely. Um, and in recent news, uh, alloc A is what ended up breaking uh, system D recently. Uh, they had an unchecked size uh, there. So just don't use VLAs. They're bad and dangerous. Um, as it turns out, they're also slow. Um, this was sort of an implicit realization like, oh yeah, there's gonna be more code to check the size and grow it. Yeah, it's probably a little bit slower to use a VLA. Uh, but in the process of doing VLA removal, um, there was the original code, a non-stack VLA, ran at about that speed, and then with a fixed size, like I want the stack to always be this big because I'll never use more than that, uh, was one solution, and the other one was to do a dynamic memory allocation, and the fixed stack size turned out to be something like 13% faster, which seemed way higher than, oh yeah, I added a couple instructions. Um, so this is some nice, actual benchmark information on the fact that the VLA usage is actually slow too, in, in addition to being security scary. Um, I wanted to go visualize that. Why? Why was it so slow? Uh, this is a bit of an exaggeration because this is without optimization, but still, um, it's still large even with O2. Um, so it's the, same, it's the same code in both sides, except one just has a dynamic uh, array size. And you can look at the assembly here, and it's just this massive amount of code. Um, I don't even know why unoptimized it's this bad. But you get a sense that there's definitely a lot happening, so that's why it's slow. Yeah, it's, it's horrific. It's completely horrific. Um, with, with, with dash O2, it's, it's definitely shorter, um, but it's a little bit hard, harder to compare because the preambles and everything change as well. Uh, this was easier to just show. This part is like that. It's horrible. <clears throat> but again, kernel is actually built with O2, so it wasn't that bad. But still, 13% performance. So if I can't convince you about its security properties, it's faster to use a fixed length array anyway. 
Um, uh, another weird one with the C language is uh, switch case, uh, switch statements um, and case fall through. Um, C has an indicator for please stop this case. It's called break, but its absence is supposed to indicate that you want to fall through. But what if you just forgot to put the break? Maybe you didn't mean to fall through. Um, so for a very long time, there was just nothing in C to indicate I actually want to fall through. Um, a lot of uh, an analysis tools like Coverity and some others started recognizing comments as an indication of whether or not fall through was intentional. Um, and this became so prevalent that this actually entered into the syntax checking of the compilers would actually parse comments in switch statements to determine whether or not this was okay. And the, like the, the C standard uh, folks, I assume, saw this and freaked out and said, this is terrible, we don't wanna parse comments, that's madness. Um, so there is sort of a statement you can add now, but really it's too late at this point. All, all the static checkers are looking for a comment, so um, you need to, to move on and add comments like this. Uh, so you can add implicit fall through, which says you, you, don't, you don't allow fall through. Well, you can warn if there is uh, a switch ends without a break or a mark of either the comment or the statement that got added recently. Um, and so uh, this, this showed up a lot in the Coverity scans of the Linux kernel. Um, and Gustavo, who I call out here, has been systematically going through and adding all of these. And where it's not obvious, asking maintainers, are you sure this was <laughs> what you meant to do? Uh, and he's found quite a lot of legitimate bugs. Um, I have some numbers in later slides, but uh, I mean, there were a couple thousand cases of this, and he's just been slowly going through. <laughs> doing uh, patch after patch after patch, getting through these. Um, um, then there's the other one, which is, I touched on it earlier, which was, um, so you have an uninitialized local variable. <clears throat> the compilers now are happy enough to say, hey, you used this variable before you initialized it, please stop that. And generally speaking, that's, you know, the, you know, the, the intent of the kernel compile is to compile without warnings, so this warning is on, and people go through and make sure all the variables are initialized, except for the case of passing a variable by reference. So if you pass it into a function, you, you pass the address of the struct or whatever into another variable, there's sort of this assumption that, oh, well that function will do something to it, so certainly it gets initialized in that function and I won't warn about it. That's not true. Um, sometimes. Uh, so there's been a push to say, okay, we just need to initialize everything. Um, we are actually are already covered on everything that's not passed by reference because that's, it's actually been fixed. So the question is, all right, well, we should initialize everything that's even passed by reference. Um, and I was not really excited about trying to have that conversation um, with very performance sensitive uh, culture of the Linux kernel, except that when this topic came up, uh, and the idea of zero initializing everything uh, was suggested, uh, Linus said he loved it. So I was very relieved. <laughs> and, and I include a reference to this in anything uh, where we're talking about uninitialized variable uh, forced initialization. Um, since uh, if Linus wants it, you can't say no. Um, uh, getting, getting this actually implemented in the compilers is an ongoing thing. Uh, from a couple years back, uh, there was a patch suggested against GCC. Uh, it's not upstream yet. Um, it had some poor interactions with, uh, for example, warning about your uninitialized variables. So if you force initialize everything, now you don't get a warning about having missed initializing something, which may be a bug because you maybe want to initialize it to something that's not zero. So the interaction with that is a little odd. Um, Clang uh, had another patch for this. Um, there have been, I think I've seen three different versions of uh, local initialization stuff for Clang. Um, I think one of them is making progress. Um, and then there's a, the struct leak uh, GCC plugin that was ported from GR security uh, was extended to cover by reference structures 
uh, but that doesn't cover non-struct things that are passed, like a character array or you know smaller things. Um, but I've been trying to get that fixed uh, recently. I'd rather have the compiler do it, but until then, maybe we can use uh, plugins. Um, one funny thing, again, leftovers from C being kind of a weird language, was uh, with the GCC patch uh, that I was playing with, if you built an initializer for a variable, uh, that's actually code that executes, right? You have to say, I want to write a zero here. So if you declare a variable in the space between a switch and the first case, it'll never get run. So the compiler correctly says, hey, you, that'll never happen. Um, so we had to, I wrote a patch. There weren't a lot of these cases though, uh, which was nice. Um, so I just had to lift all of those up out of uh, switch statements um, so the compiler would be happy. Um, so I had that patch and there was, like again, uh, I think I sent that out somewhat recently, yesterday or something, um, and no one freaked out about auto-initializing all your variables. They were just upset that um, maybe we were gonna move things out of switch statements that looked weird anyway. I'm like, okay, that's fine. I'll have that discussion. Um, another whole case is um, overflow detection in, when, when doing math. Uh, GCC has an option to, to deal with this, um, but it only works for signed overflow conditions. Um, but that's okay, you probably wanna catch those anyway. Um, I'm stuck in trying to figure out how to, what to do with it right now for the kernel in particular, um, because it's very fast to check, because it's, it's literally a single instruction to check for the, the overflow, the, in, the bit uh, in the CPU. Um, so I can, I can go the abort route where it'll kill the process and do all these things, but Linus has said we can't do those things. Or it gets very, very big because you generate these warnings. Um, so the kernel or the, uh, the compiler still needs to be updated for this um, so that we can have sort of a, an intermediate position where we could throw a warning and not freak out, um, but we don't carry with us the entire baggage of the warning text. Uh, that's why the, the, the size of the kernel would change so large, it would be such a large change, because every case where there is a, a possible arithmetic overflow, uh, assigned overflow, uh, you add the string that says, I had an overflow over here, it was this much by that value, and that text just gets repeated and repeated and repeated everywhere. Um, so having a common handler would be nicer uh, for that. Uh, in the meantime, we can sort of go through an opt-in to dealing, uh, dealing with this directly with overflow catching uh, operators, um, like the check add overflow and the check mull overflow. Um, we even have a shift overflow detector now. Um, I, that's good, it's nice to use that when we can, but I prefer global coverage instead of an opt-in case uh, because that, those are slow. Uh, but we do have them if you wanna actually uh, check for overflow. Um, Clang adds uh, an unsigned integer overflow. Uh, I'd really like to get the kernel clean on both signed and unsigned integer overflows. The problem is there are a lot of cases in the kernel where there is intentional unsigned overflows. So then you have to find all of those and mark them as yes, yes, I wanted that. Um, Clang does allow for a variety of different types of failure cases. You can warn and continue, you can Warn and abort, you can abort without a warning, you can do a bunch of, a bunch of different things. So there's a little bit more flexibility in how uh, Clang would instrument the kernel for, for reporting these, these conditions. Um, so I'm, I'd like to get GCC up to that level so we'd have a, a better way to deal with that inside the kernel. Um, and the favorite one, bounds checking. So explicit, like dealing with buffer overflows, whether it's a stack overflow, heap, whatever, um, doing explicit checking does get time consuming. And I have these numbers up here. It's like less than 1%, okay, cool. 2%, people start getting angry. 1%, maybe. And then sort of compare that against, well, but here's the threat of this other security flaw where we turn off hyper-threading, which is like a 50% reduction in performance. What's 2%? Um, I haven't really gotten a lot of traction on that yet, but I, I'm, I'd like to do this. Uh, the trouble with the explicit bounds checking is you actually need 
to confidently know what it is that you're going to bounds check against. Um, in the, the hardened user copy, the first one listed there, uh, the check is, if it's a stack variable, you can say, okay, you didn't exceed the, the actual kernel stack. And since we've removed f like the, the per frame markings in the kernel, we can't always check that it stayed within a stack frame. Um, so we've lost that granularity. So the, the granularity on that check is kind of large. And if it's coming out of a slab allocation in the kernel, slab heap memory, we can look and see, okay, we know where this was allocated, we know the size of this allocation, now we have bounds checking we can do. Uh, if it came out of a page allocator, sometimes you can see that it, what the size of the allocation was, and other times it was merged in, you know, like two network packets came in and they said, well, you're next to each other, now we'll claim you're one packet. But the allocator doesn't actually know that it's continuous and things get confused, so the, while we can add explicit checking in a lot of these cases, um, the granularity of check depends on the underlying memory allocation. Um, so uh, related to this, of course, are our terrible APIs. So here's my, my page on string copy. <clears throat> we'll start at the top. String copy has no bounds checking at all. Don't use it. Um, string end copy does not always null terminate. <clears throat> so don't use it for C strings. But it's in the C library. So it is, however, good for copying a C string into a non-C string fixed size buffer that you don't want to leak more information out of because it will null pad the entire destination uh, if it's shorter than the destination. But if the destination is exactly the size of the string, it will not null terminate it. So if you're dealing with weird things that aren't actually a C string, they're like a fixed array of bytes, sure, use string and copy, uh, but you can actually mark those with like underscore, underscore, non-string, and then GCC will not be happy. Yes, there are many such buffers like that in V6. In, in V6 what? In V17. Yes. Yes, if you uh, have V6 and V7 unices still, please continue to use string and copy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, string L copy was added as a, well, let's just null terminate it anyway, come on. Uh, except string L copy will actually call string lang, uh, string len on the source to determine how long it is before terminating it. So your string len may just read off the end of memory or do some other things. So don't use string L copy. So, okay, what's left? String S copy, okay. So this returns the number of bytes actually copied. Uh, not including the null, and it null terminates, or it returns, uh, and if it gets truncated by that, uh, it'll return E2 big, so you can actually test uh, what it's sent. Uh, but it, of course, does not null pad a destination if you don't want to be leaking fixed sized things out, so then you have to null pad a destination if you want to do that, but so we don't have a helper that'll actually do both string S copies job and string N copies job at the same time. Safely, you just have to do a memset open coded. So we need a helper for that. But generally speaking, you want string S copy. <sighs> so then there is S printf. S printf has no bounds checking, do not use it. Uh, string N printf does null terminate, unlike string N copy with the same N name, whatever. Um, but string N printf returns how much it would have written not how much it did. So, <laughs> so you can call uh, snprintf with a null target and a size of zero and a format and all your arguments to determine how large the resulting format will resolve to. And then you can allocate that much memory and then you call it again with that as a target. That's sort of its design. Except when you do things like this, where you're adding on to a larger and larger string and you're just taking the output of snprintf. Um, the good news is that many kernel releases ago, uh, when, the, when the size of buff minus count went negative and became a giant number, um, snprintf learned to say, that's probably not what you meant. 
I will in fact not write lots and lots of memory all over the place. I will return zero. Um, but the one that did overflow will have overflowed the, the, the counter there. It will be larger than your destination size. So when you then go copy it back to user space, you copy your buffer plus whatever's after it beyond what you had. So there's a lot of places where you leak an inappropriate size. So use scn printf, which of course is not part of any C library except in the kernel. <clears throat> Maybe I'm wrong about that, but I couldn't find. So um, scn printf always null terminates and returns the count of bytes actually copied so you can safely use it in the above code. But of course it's a kernel, so we can't just globally search and replace because there are places that want to know that it overflowed and SCN printf won't tell you that it overflowed. And so they're still using SN printf. And anyway, so if you find yourself in this situation, please use SC and printf in the kernel, of course. And I was gonna come back around to memcopy. Uh, be careful, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the, the problem is with usage patterns for these functions, which is there's much like, um, much like this thing where you're trying to append to a buffer. You're like building output and you have multiple formats or you're doing a bunch of different things in a row. Um, you get that a lot with memcopy too. You're building up a structure that you're gonna write to disk or you're gonna send it over the network or you're doing things. So there's this, this pattern of usage that happens a lot that we have virtually no uh, API support for. It's like, well, this is something we wanna do a lot. We should really have some libraries that you know, support us in, in getting that job done. Um, anyway, so continuing past the horrors of bounds checking, uh, the future is always brighter, so we'll have memory tagging in hardware. Um, <laughs> uh, Spark did this with their ADI, uh, the ARM v8.5 memory tagging extension will have this in the near to distant future. Um, uh, there do not appear to be plans yet uh, that are public or known f uh, for Intel supporting it, um, it would be nice. So in the, in the little diagram I've got here, uh, the tagging works by actually using bytes in the top, like in using bits, I should say, in the top byte of the, the, ad, the pointer that you get back. So for example, you would call kmalloc for some size and it writes a tag in the beginning and when you dereference that, the kernel says, well, you're gonna go over here and your offset is like 40 hex, so you're still inside that tagged area. Um, and then if, that, if you increment that pointer beyond the tagged area that it has, when that dereference occurs, it goes and compares the tag in the pointer you're using with the tag at the memory location you've just arrived at. And if they do not match, this will fault. Um, and this basically would stop um, whole classes of, uh, of linear overflows, most of the problems I just talked about in the terrible API um, items. Um, it doesn't help uh, much like jumping over the guard page with the stack protectors. It doesn't help if you know two different regions of memory that share the same tag and you are able to perform an index jump over to the other tag but at least linear, direct linear overflows will be blocked. Um, and this also doesn't solve situations where you have, so that, that'll, that'll solve most inter-object, like neighboring object overflows, uh, but it does not solve going like within an object, you have a struct or something and you have a fixed length character array and you've got sensitive information after that. And you can mem copy past the end of your structure, or end of your buffer into the more fields in the same structure, you're still in the same tagged area, um, this has happened with things like really long ESS IDs and Wi-Fi drivers who have one giant structure for everything. Um, so it's not, doesn't solve everything, but it gets us a lot it's fixed, yeah. Your example there is a right, this is also applicable. Yes, um, as, yeah, uh, so this, I'm, I'm using a right example, um, and the question was, does this also apply to reads? And my understanding <coughs> is that both ADI and MTE would freak out on a, on a read, so it's any memory access. Um, although, now I wanna know if execute would be protected since that's <laughs> on a, usually on a different path. Anyway, um, 
So then, oh, I, I went immediately to execute. That was good. So control flow integrity. Um, this is protecting us against uh, ROP attacks, anything where we're dealing with a redirection of execution after some kind of write uh, happened. Um, and I touched on this earlier where I said you go from C where you say, all right, I'm, re I'm returning an int, I'm taking these different structure pointers, you have a whole prototype of all that. All that information gets lost normally uh, when you go down to machine language and you save pointers to functions in the heap, you save return addresses on the stack and all that type information, and all the you know, uh, call graph information is just not, not present. Um, and here's I'm trying to demonstrate, you're making a function call out to a new function, that's the forward edge, and when you return from that function, that's the backward edge to return to where you were. And in those cases on the heap, for example, or somewhere, you've stored a function pointer that you're gonna go to, and on the stack you've got your return address going back. Um, and these, again, just pointers. If you force an, an override of the, the function types uh, in here, C will compile down to assembly and you run it and it says, you know, my check here is either call function one or function two, um, and I've, I've forced a weird void pointer overflow, but it, or not over, uh, miscast, but it doesn't care, it's still function, it'll call it. So if you run it, you get one or the other. Um, if you actually enforce prototype checking, so CFI, for example, in Clang with uh, sanitized CFI, it'll actually attempt to retain that information about those functions and, and has a method to check at call times, are you part of the family of functions that match this prototype? Uh, so in this case, the, my overridden function to, to call to uh, will fail and CFI breaks me. Uh, the CFI check will, will stop, stop that. Um, that's really nice. So on the backwards edge, what can we do? Um, Clang has a, a safe stack where it tries to separate these into two stack areas. Um, so you have you know, unsafe things that are buffers and by reference, by reference variables and things it can't really check and a safe stack which contains the automatic register spills that it might be doing, variables it can, it can reason about to be safe, and return addresses. Um, so that all the bad stuff happens in one area of memory and the safe stuff happens in another. Um, there are pros and cons to this. Um, and then there's a shadow call stack um, which has some hardware support uh, which I, I get to. But uh, this splits it into just storing the return address. Everything else is in the normal stack, that's fine, but it's really our control, control flow stuff that we wanna keep uh, attached to. So we try to have, effectively, two stack registers all the time. Um, a problem with doing this in software is that if, as an attacker, you can figure out where the, where the sensitive stack is, you can still overwrite it. Um, so CFI backward edge hardware support, uh, the Intel CET has effectively a read-only shadow stack uh, that does what the prior slide is talking about, but it has an, an, has an ability to implicitly write to a region of memory that is normally read-only, um, which is handy because even if you figure out what, where that is in memory as an attacker, you cannot directly write to it. Uh, and then in ARM, the 8.3a pointer authentication is effectively signing with a, a couple bits, but that's uh, good enough. Um, when you enter and when you leave a function. So you, you end up with a signed return address uh, as a way of thinking about it. Um, and that's uh, quite effective as well. <clears throat> so the question is, where is the Linux kernel right now? Uh, variable length arrays, uh, they have finally been eradicated uh, as of 4.20, WVLA is the default build. And as far as I can tell, we'll never add them back. Um, that was, uh, that was a, uh, a lot of people helping with that. Um, I'm very, uh, it was, we started a concerted effort on it about four releases ago and with a lot of people working on that, uh, we got through it. Um, it would have taken me a lot, a lot longer without all that help. Um, the explicit case, uh, switch case fall through, um, this has largely been Gustavo just plugging away at it, but um, I went back and counted from before when Gustavo had started on it, and we had about 2,300 of these uh, situ situations. Um, and he told me, I think this morning, that at least in Linux Next, uh, we are down to 232 of those. So we've done 90%. <laughs> um, doing always initialized variables, 
I can't predict where that's going to end up. Uh, having Linus say that he wants it obviously means that it's not, uh, it is a matter of technical challenge, not social challenge. Um, and a lot of, a lot of these, uh, a lot of the kernel hardening features tend to be, you know, a political and social challenge and a technical challenge. So um, I feel like that's probably good. A lot of the work's been done in plugins already. There's active interest in fixing it uh, globally for, for the compilers. Um, so I think that'll happen soon, and I hope that um, by next LCA, I can report uh, that that's taken care of. Um, the arithmetic overflow detection, I think that has a, a really long tail because there's a lot of error cases and weird conditions um, where we're gonna do that. Um, and if you've followed um, SysCaller, at all and the huge dashboard of bugs that SysCaller reports, uh, they don't even turn on the arithmetic overflow detection portion of SysCaller because it produces so many reports. And they already have so many reports that uh, people are flooded with that. So while I'd, like to, while I'd like to get to that, I am concerned it's gonna be a while before we make any serious progress on it. Um, bounds checking, well, We'll deal with performance concerns and then wait impatiently for hardware support. Um, we'll still need to deal with that more. Uh, I, I, think that making, I think that making a better standard library for dealing with things would help a lot in that and just to avoid the bugs. Um, CFI, both forward and back, uh, there has been a lot of progress uh, in the Android kernel team uh, <laughs> making this work under Clang with link time optimization. The Pixel 3 has working uh, CFI for their kernel. Um, there's gonna be a lot more work necessary to get this uh, all the way upstream, um, but it does work on production systems and that's pretty great. Uh, and again, waiting for hardware support uh, again uh, on, on that. There's another place where we go, but uh, until then we can do that. We can wait for it. Um, so we have challenges in kernel security developments. Um, there's a lot of conservatism uh, dealing with the responsibility of, of maintaining code. Um, there's some sacrifice to that uh, patience. I have this gift because that's sort of how I feel sometimes. Um, but there's, uh, there's, some, there's a lot of technical com complexity. There's innovation to be done. There's a lot of, you know, there's been a theme of the keynotes on collaboration and that's why I think we've made, we've had, made a lot of progress because so many people are working on this together. Um, and we have, uh, we need more resources. We need more people doing it. Um, reviewers even just say, hey, it booted. I love it, go for it. Um, uh, while I don't like to admit it, we do need people to backport this stuff because there are some, some devices, products, or things that are just stuck on older kernel versions and getting some of these features backported uh, would really help. Um, and that's uh, really all I have with some links and other things. Hi, Case. Um, as I'm, 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 I'm obviously a big fan of kernel hardening. I've, I've made some contributions of my own. Um, one of the concerns I have about the compiler-assisted um, hardening, like uh, address, address sanitizer, for example, is that they add an awful lot of code. And I appreciate this is code that the um, CPU has no particular problems executing. It's all pretty fast. But when I'm trying to debug a problem, I find that the code produced by the compiler is incredibly hard to read once the address sanitizer is turned on. And so that makes debugging harder for me, and that makes me sad. <laughs> and what should we do about it? <laughs> yes. Um, I think that um, the, the ASAN stuff is incredibly aggressive in, in how it is checking everything all the time. Uh, and that leads to the problem uh, that you're talking about. I, I think the... Um, and normal sane people will not turn that on in production. Uh, <laughs> uh, because there are, there is pretty significant performance penalties as well. Uh, but when you're debugging a thing where you say, it is shown, it is seen here, I can't read this code. Um, I don't have a good solution for that, but the piece that I, the pieces of ASAN that I do want to turn on are actually pretty small. Um, like I talked about the, the signed overflow check is literally one extra instruction. It says, did the overflow bit get set? Go there if I did. The go there is very large in some cases, um, but I think that 
the stuff that would be reasonable to turn on in production would not get in anyone's way. And dealing with the, the difficulty of reading ASAN output in a debug build is, is painful. I don't have any idea <laughs> how to improve that. <laughs> Hardware support? Yeah. Memory tagging. I'm there. Sign me up. I have to ask. Yes. With the new world of eBPF coming to the Linux kernel, uh -huh. <laughs> what's your thoughts on that? Um, so, uh, you know, any new addition of a VM anywhere gives me the creeps. Uh, but the thing I, uh, I noted at the beginning of, of eBPF really taking off, and I try to remind myself regularly, is that uh, even though it too can be flawed, the eBPF has a verifier. Um, it's part of the tooling is something that actually checks the byte stream that's going to go through the VM that will eventually hit a JIT or do everything else. So uh, it's not a complete wild west of, of being able to trust the byte codes that go through eBPF. Um, there have been flaws in the, in, the, in the verifier, of course, but the fact is we fix those flaws and we move on. Um, so it is catching the things we shouldn't be allowing. Like we already had, there is an infrastructure in place built alongside EPPF uh, that was designed with that security in mind. Um, so I, I, I have not lost a lot of sleep at night over that just because I know it's part of the design of it. Um, that said, it creeps me out. Well, uh, a follow up real quick on that is the fact that, you know, yes, right now all the verifier and everything like that, but you know, Everyone wants more and more out of it. Uh -huh. And it seems like every time they add something more, it just makes it less secure. That's... Yes, this is why I find it creepy. <laughs> it's the, the, the sort of scope creep on, on eBPF does have me worried. But what I, again, coming back to the verifier, is there is actually a relatively formalized approach to saying that is an inappropriate function because it lets you read kernel memory. Um, so we need to, you know, limit it in this fashion. Like there, there is actually a design there. In theory, there is an overall design goal about what EPPF should be and should not be allowed to do as opposed to it being just completely ad hoc. Um, so, I mean, it exists, people are going to use it. It's going to expand. It will have bugs. It has had bugs. It's going to be having bugs, but you could ask me the same thing about how I feel about networking or USB or whatever else. <laughs> I, I mean, they're useful things. We need to have them. But uh, as it turns out, USB does not have a command verifier necessarily built into its design. So eBPF's better than that. <laughs> not to pick on USB. Yeah. You, um, you mentioned that memcopy doesn't take uh, destination size, but I was just reading through the standard, and uh, one of the things that I find with the C standard one is hard to get hold of, which is what I faced right now. It's added a lot of things, including a variant of memcopy that has checks. Okay. The the second uh, thing that I was going to talk about is that we don't necessarily have a secure programming, secure coding standard for Linux in the sense that there is no guidance for programmers except for review as to how you do secure coding, and we're supposed to make the entire system secure. That's true. Having, a, having better guidelines on that would be uh, very welcome. Um, I think getting rid of our terrible APIs would help first. Um, and that's quite a challenge. Uh, writing Cox and L scripts actually helps quite a bit in this to find poor patterns in, in code uh, and being able to um, document that. Uh, I started a, a deprecated list to sort of describe things that you shouldn't do or functions we shouldn't use or things we should replace with it. And, I got to the point where I was like, well, I want to deprecate using SNPrintf, but only when you're doing an additive, like, and I was like, oh, this is a coding style, like, this is a coding description, and um, I'd like to build on that. Um, the trouble I've had is if you make it this huge document, no one's going to absorb it. So I'm trying to figure out what the best approach to getting the right mindset for, for coding safely is, and it seems like just better API design gets you in a place. If you can't shoot yourself in the foot, you'll be better off, although it's C, it's really easy to shoot your foot off. We're um, out of time, so please, another round of applause for Case Cook. <laughs> <laughs>